Okay, good day, everyone. I still see people trickling in, so I'm going to give it a few more seconds uh, before we get started. Okay, so good day, everyone, and uh, welcome to the CERC seminar series. Uh, very happy that you're all joining. Uh, my name is Sana, and I'll be hosting uh, today's speakers, uh, Dr. Ian Tobias and Dr. Jennifer Mitchell. Um, before we get started, I have one quick announcement uh, that is a safe date for uh, this year's annual general meeting from CERC, uh, which will be taking place uh, from October 1st till 4th at the Blue Mountain Resort, which is uh, near Toronto. Um, then a kind reminder that if you have any questions during the talks to please post them in the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and with that being said, uh, it is a real pleasure to introduce our first speaker of today, which will be Dr. Jennifer Mitchell. Uh, Jennifer completed her PhD at the University of Toronto, uh, after which she went on to do a postdoc with Peter Fraser at the University of Cambridge. Uh, she then came back to Canada and is currently a professor at the Department of Cell and Systems Biology at the University of Toronto, where her lab investigates um, mechanisms that underlie tissue-specific regulation of gene expression and genome folding. Um, today, Jennifer will be talking about enhancers in development and disease. Um, Jennifer, whenever you're ready to start sharing your screen, go for it, and then the floor is all yours. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, just, we practiced this, but it's behaving a little differently at the moment. So. Always does. <laughs> yes. There we go. Okay. Share screen. Okay. Do you see my slideshow? Uh, I don't. Oh, goodness. It's not okay. Is it presenter view or is it? Oh, no, sorry. No, there I we go. Uh, okay. There. Okay. So you see the slideshow? Perfect. You're okay. Okay. Good. And if I advance my slide, it's going to work, hopefully. Okay, there we go. We'll just make that smaller so I don't have to look at myself talking. All right, so thank you everybody for uh, joining today for um, the seminar for myself and Ian Tobias as well, who uh, was a postdoc in my lab and has just started uh, an independent position at the University of Guelph. Um, I'm going to be speaking first today and then uh, Ian is going to tell you at his work uh, about his work at the end of my seminar. Uh, so my lab uh, really focuses on studying uh, enhancers, which are transcriptional regulatory elements that are usually found in the non-coding part of the genome, and they have really important roles in development and in disease. Okay. Um, so enhancers are generally uh, short, uh, around one kilobase uh, pieces of uh, DNA that can be found at really long distances away from the genes that they regulate. So as opposed to the proximal promoter, which is just upstream of the transcription start site, enhancers can be at kilobase or even megabase distances away from the genes they regulate. And that um, causes some challenges in terms of identifying where enhancers are in the genome and which genes they regulate. Um, but one of the ways we can identify uh, where potential enhancers are in the genome is by looking for chromatin features that they exhibit. For example, they tend to be nucleosome uh, depleted regions of open chromatin. They are also bound by a number of different transcription factors uh, when they are transcriptionally active. And those transcription factors can recruit coactivators such as histone modifying enzymes like EP300 and the mediator, as well as the mediator complex. And because they recruit these coactivators, they tend to also have modifications that are found in the flanking nucleosome surrounding the enhancer, which include um, histone lysine 4 monomethylation and histone lysine uh, 27 acetylation. 
Um, of course, I mentioned already that enhancers are really important for regulating tissue specific expression. So whereas basal promoters tend to just turn a gene on at low levels in a larger number of, di of different cell types, enhancers can really fine tune the spatial and temporal regulation of uh, the expression of a particular gene. And what I'm showing you here is an example from the VISTA enhancer database of a piece of DNA that regulates high level expression of a uh, reporter gene in the mouse uh, forebrain at mid gestation. So we also know that enhancers tend to um, form these uh, larger chromatin structures, often referred to as uh, chromatin loops, whereby they become more closely associated with the genes they regulate in the three-dimensional space of the nucleus. And this is one way that we can formulate a hypothesis about which specific enhancer might be regulating a specific gene. And then from a, a smaller number of well-studied examples, we know that deletion or mutation of enhancers can be associated uh, with disease and uh, developmental um, abnormalities. Okay. So here's an example of a well-studied locus from the perspective, perspective of an enhance, a distal enhancer that regulates gene expression. And this is in fact the first characterized example from the human genome of uh, a tissue specific enhancer that regulates um, gene expression. And what I'm showing you here is the beta globin locus. So the beta globin locus contains a number of different developmentally regulated genes. And then upstream of that beta globin, those beta globin genes is what's called the beta globin LCR. And this is a number of um, open chromatin regions bound by uh, different transcription factors that together regulate the high level expression of the beta globin genes in different contexts throughout development. And this um, locus control region was first identified because patients with a rare beta thalassemia blood disorder, which presents as um, an inability to express beta globin at high levels, actually didn't have any mutations or issues with their uh, gene sequence, but had deletions in this locus control region that was causing low expression of uh, the cluster of beta globin genes. We now know from a number of genome-wide association studies that I'm showing you uh, below here that there are specific single nucleotide polymorphisms that occur in the human population throughout this locus control region, and that some of these are linked to uh, the levels of hemoglobin concentration in blood. So we can learn from these genome-wide association studies the way in which single nucleotide changes can alter the function of this enhancer, although we still don't really have a good understanding of how each um, sequence, each uh, base within this enhancer contributes to function. So even though this is the mo one of the most well-studied examples, we're still missing some information about translating sequence into function, even for uh, this well-studied enhancer. Okay. So I, I give you the beta globin example because that's what I worked on during my postdoc. But in fact, when I started my lab at the University of Toronto, we actually initially started with working in uh, stem cell models. And we chose to work with mouse pluripotent stem cells. And at the time, these were really an ideal system for studying transcriptional regulation because, of course, the four uh, transcription factors, the Yamanaka factors, that can take drive a fibroblast from its fully differentiated state back to a state of induced pluripotency had been discovered um, a few years before. And so we knew that these transcription factors were really important in regulating the pluripotent cell state. And so we wanted to study more about this transcriptional regulatory network. Another reason why um, mouse embryonic stem cells were a good system to study transcriptional regulation and still are, is that there's a really large number of chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing experiments that have been done uh, for this cell type that identify where a number of transcription factors are binding the genome, where coactivators are recruited, where members of the mediator complex and polymerase are recruited. Um, and then of course, we also know about gene expression. And so that allows us to formulate hypotheses about which regions of the genome might be regulating a particular gene. And although my lab does a number of 
additional techniques to look at gene expression regulation, one of our sort of gold standard approaches to really know that we're looking at an active and bona fide enhancer for a particular gene um, is to uh, use a CRISPR deletion approach to remove a large chunk of DNA and then ask, you know, how, what what DNA does that, uh, what, what gene does that piece of DNA regulate? And one of the first gene loci that my lab started looking at was, in fact, one of the Yamanaka factors, the SOX2 gene itself. And we asked the question, how is the SOX2 gene regulated in pluripotent cells? Um, we also sort of made use of another um, system that was at our disposal, which are these um, F1 mouse embryonic stem cells that are generated by, by mating a musculus 1 to 9 mouse to a castaneous mouse, and the resulting um, embryonic stem cells from that cross have a single nucleotide polymorphism on average every 125 base pairs in the genome, which then allows us to identify um, deletions to a, an allele by parent of origin, and also to look at allele-specific gene expression. So we can really study how enhancers work by looking at a monoallelic deletion of an enhancer and looking at how that modifies expression of gene linked genes on the same chromosome. And these cells are actually uh, female embryonic stem cells, and they were we originally obtained them from Barbara Panning, who had been using them to study exon activation. Okay, and so coming back to the SOX2 locus, um, I'm going to sort of orient you for where what we're looking at. This is just over um, 100,000 kilobases of um, DNA on, on the um, mouse chromosome 3, and you, what you can see here is the SOX2 gene, which is a small intronless gene located right here. And then we had collated a large number of different chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing experiments, which you can see down here, um, showing us where individual different transcription factors that we knew were important in the pluripotent state were binding to the genome. And we initially kind of focused in on this region here because it had the largest number of different transcription factors uh, that, that was bound to this uh, region of about uh, eight kilobases of DNA. And to us, this kind of looked like the beta globin locus control region enhancer. And so we thought, well, maybe this is one of the more important regions for regulating SOX2 transcription in embryonic stem cells. And so we did a number of initial experiments um, to look at whether or not this region contained any enhancers. And we found two classical enhancers that work um, in a vector reporter assays. But of course, to really show that this region was required for SOX2 expression, we used a CRISPR approach to delete um, this entire region um, of the, of the, of, 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 that was transcription factor bound, um, and then look at what happened to SOX2 gene expression. And because we can look at allele-specific expression, we didn't just look at SOX2, but we decided to do an RNA-seq and then look at um, all of the linked alleles and see which ones might be changing expression. And so from that allele-specific RNA-seq experiment, we found that in fact, SOX2 was the only significantly um, modified uh, gene in these cells when we had deleted the enhancer on just one allele. So when we deleted the enhancer on the 1 to 9 allele, we saw that SOX2 on the 1 to 9 allele displayed reduced expression. And so this told us that this enhancer is likely only regulating SOX2 in this context. But we also wanted to look at whether or not this level of disruption to SOX2 expression might do anything to the cellular phenotype. And so to study that, we actually also looked at clones where the enhancer was deleted on both alleles. Um, and what we found in that case was that when we looked at the SCR, or, so when we looked at this enhancer region, which we termed the SCR for the SOX2 control region, and that was kind of our nod to the beta globin control region, and this enhancer shares a lot of features with that beta globin LCR. 
Um, what we saw was that when we look at genome-wide expression now in cells that are missing the enhancer on both alleles, again, SOX2 expression is still the most downregulated in the genome, but we now see a number of additional downregulated genes here, as well as a number of different upregulated genes. And the upregulated genes actually um, are genes that are normally not expressed in ES cells, but they're actually expressed in the trophectoderm lineage. And that sort of mirrors what happens when you knock down SOX2 gene expression, you start to see expression of some trophectoderm lineage markers. We also looked a little bit more closely at these, this cluster of downregulated genes and actually noticed that they were clustered on the X. And that suggested to us that these cells had actually under, at least partially undergone a, pro a process of X inactivation, which is normally what happens when these cells start to differentiate. Um, and through looking at these um, two measures, as well as some morphological measures of the cells, we concluded that after biallelic deletion of the SCR, these cells become partially uh, differentiated, meaning they lo somewhat lose their naive pluripotency phenotype, and that this enhancer is then really required to maintain that phenotype through maintaining the expression of SOX2. Okay. But you may have been wondering, well, why didn't we look at these regions closer to the gene as well? They're kind of close to the gene, maybe they're also important. And it was maybe serendipitous that this was the region we deleted first. It was actually the first CRISPR deletion that my lab ever did, and it's kind of been the one that gave us the really clearest phenotype. Um, because we next did turn our attention to these transcription factor bound regions closer to the gene. And in fact, when we very carefully made a deletion, of each one of these regions that surrounded the gene, as well as deleting everything that was transcription back factor bound that was more proximal to the SOX2 gene, we actually saw no effect whatsoever on transcription. So whereas the previous experiment that I showed you sort of you know, took us a few weeks to do in the lab and we got this really exciting result, these next number of deletions took several, several months and we actually sort of found no phenotype associated with them. So just to draw, orient you to what I'm showing you, I'm showing you the expression coming from each allele, from the 129 allele in gray and the cast allele in blue. And if you sort of look across all of these deletions, you see really no significant disruption to gene expression. And even in this case over here, where we've deleted this upstream region and these, this entire downstream region, we actually see no effect on SOX2 transcription. And so this sort of taught us that just because we see transcription factor binding and open chromatin and histone modifications that suggest that a region might be an active enhancer, it doesn't actually mean that those regions are really contributing to the expression um, of that gene. And so this just, this just kind of reinforced to us that we really needed to continue to make these deletions when we were identifying new potentially interesting regulatory elements in the genome. Okay. And so just as quick summary of what I just showed you, I talked about the SOX2 gene and the fact that we identified this SOX2 control region, which is just over 100 kilobases downstream of the SOX2 gene. And we had looked at these closer regions um, that didn't seem to have any role in regulating SOX2 in this context. Um, but Ian is going to later show you some information, especially about this downstream region, that it's really important in the neural lineage. So I'm just going to throw that in as a little bit of a teaser. But um, after we had done this work, we started thinking more broadly about other contexts in which SOX2 is expressed and also disease context in which SOX2 is misregulated and we wanted to understand what was happening in those cases. And so um, we started to look at SOX2 overexpression in cancer and one of the reasons why we wanted to do this is that SOX2 is actually overexpressed in multiple different types of cancer. And we were interested to know whether or not this would be due to a common regulatory mechanism or maybe, you know, vastly different regulatory mechanisms. Okay. And, you know, why, why is SOX2 um, overexpression in cancers potentially so damaging? Well, um, transcription factors are really known in when they become overexpressed in cancer to largely misregulate the transcriptome. 
And because SOX2 has this ability to bind closed chromatin and um, recruit um, histone modifying activity that will actually modify and cause chromatin opening, and that's known as this pioneering activity of SOX2, we thought that expression of this protein, you know, could be quite damaging in a cancer context. And so we really wanted to look at the regulatory mechanisms. This was actually the PhD project of a fantastic PhD student, Dr. Luis Sabati, who uh, graduated in from my lab, um, I think just over a year ago now. Um, and he first did a lot of work in looking at um, available uh, transcriptome and epigenome data that was available through uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas program. And what I'm showing you here is the expression of SOX2 in a number of different cancers compared to the expression in normal tissue. And what you can see is, again, this over uh, higher expression of SOX2 in many different cancers that don't normally express SOX2. He also looked at how this would affect patient uh, survivability and found that for those patients that in those in those cancers where they don't normally express SOX2 in the normal tissue and they overexpress SOX2, they're actually in this group that has a worse um, prognosis and a lower survival um, over, over uh, five to 10 years. And so we thought it was really important to look at the regulatory mechanisms. Um, another uh, thing, another uh, concept that Luis initially looked at was whether or not there was evidence in these cases for duplication of the gene. Because in fact, one way that transcription factors can become upregulated in cancer is just that the gene becomes duplicated. But we, you know, of course, because we study enhancers, we're thinking, well, if that's the case, then maybe it's less, it's not something that we should spend our a lot of time on. But, you know, if the gene is not, ten, doesn't tend to be duplicated in cancers that we're looking at, maybe it's actually due to this um, enhancer mediated mechanism, this more epigenetic mechanism that might be overexpressing SOX2. And in fact, in most of the cancers that Luis looked at, what he found was that um, SOX2, where SOX2 is overexpressed, it's largely still diploid. So in breast, in liver, um, in glioblastoma, and in lung, usually SOX2 is actually um, mostly diploid. In colorectal cancer, SOX2 is actually tends to be a little bit more downregulated. So that's a bit of a different story. And then in lung squamous cell cancer, there are a number of patients that have SOX2 amplification and overexpression of SOX2, but actually still there are a large number of patients that don't have any SOX2 amplification and still overexpress SOX2. So even in the squamous case, there are a number of patients that are still diploid, but overexpress um, this gene. And so we concluded that most of the cancers that show upregulation of SOX2 still maintain SOX2 uh, diploidy. Okay, so what are the mechanisms that are driving SOX2 overexpression in cancer? And to start to get an idea of that, we wanted to really look at patient samples. And so we looked at a large database of um, attack seek data that was in the Cancer Genome Atlas. And this was a large database from patient tumors. And most of these samples have matched RNA-seq data so that we can look at the correlation between chromatin accessibility and RNA-seq. And our initial hypothesis, just reorient reorienting you back to the SOX2 locus, was actually that we thought, well, maybe this pluripotency enhancer is getting aberrantly reactivated in a number of cancers. And so maybe there's this common mechanism. And so that was kind of our early hypothesis for what might be going on. And so what I'm showing you here is just a very small snapshot of the Cancer Genome Atlas attack seek data that shows open chromatin in a number of different tumors. So I'm showing you here bladder, breast, two types of lung cancer, stomach, and uterine cancer. And what you can see here is that surrounding the SOX2 gene, there is some open chromatin. Um, and But actually, um, so there's the SOX2 gene. Actually, the human counterpart of the mouse SCR that I showed you earlier is really showing almost no open chromatin across these cancers and doesn't really seem to show open chromatin in, in most uh, cancer subtypes. 
but instead Luis noticed these other regions that were just a little bit closer to the gene that he named SRR124 and 134 for how far away they are from the human gene that showed open chromatin across this large number of cancers. So using that TCAG um, atlas data, he also looked at whether or not there was correlation between open chromatin at the enhancer and open chromatin at the SOX2 promoter. And I'm showing you here these correlation plots for the 124 and the 134 region. And he did see a significant and positive correlation between open chromatin at the enhancer and open chromatin at the gene promoter. And then he also looked at whether or not there was any correlation between open chromatin at the enhancers and SOX2 expression. And what he found was that for patients that tended to have a more closed uh, 124, 134 presumptive enhancer region, they tended to have lower SOX2 expression and those that had more open chromatin in those regions would have a significantly higher SOX2 expression. So all of this looked promising to suggest that that region was actually regulating high SOX2 expression in these patient tumors. And now, of course, it's kind of, it's gonna be difficult for us to study that in um, cells isolated from patient tumors. And so that's where we now turned to um, well-characterized um, cancer cell lines to look at some of the re regulatory mechanisms in more detail. And what I'm showing you here are um, some chromatin feature data from normal breast tissue where you can really see the gene is not modified nor is are the enhancers. And then the same data from MCF7 cells where you can now see that there's open chromatin and histone modifications around the gene that correlate with activity. And then there's also open chromatin and histone modifications around those two potential enhancers that correlate with activity. And we also were able to look at some um, chromatin confirmation data and notice that there were um, distal links between these potential enhancers and the SOX2 promoter, which I'm showing in uh, pink at the bottom there. Similar story for another breast cancer cell line, which is T47D. And then also in uh, lung, cell, lung cell lines, we also saw that um, these uh, enhancers were displaying uh, features associated uh, open chromatin and histone modification, suggesting they might be active enhancers in um, a few different uh, lung cancer cell lines. And this was different from the lung normal uh, tissue, which doesn't tend to be accessible or uh, histone modified. And so now we had some cell systems that we could work with. And we, the first thing uh, that Luis did was to, of course, target uh, guides up stream and downstream of these two enhancers and delete them to see whether or not there was actually an effect on SOX2. And in, as you can see, I'm showing you here for MCF7s and for PC9s, a heterozygous deletion of the enhancer caused a disruption to SOX2 expression and a homozygous deletion of the enhancer really caused SOX2 to be um, at very, very low and almost undetectable uh, levels. And in fact, it's not significantly different from the levels that are found in the normal uh, tissue. And so we were really excited about this because uh, now we had our proof that this region was in fact regulating SOX2 overexpression in these two different types of cancer. And then we wanted to study, well, does this have any sort of knock-on phenotype for um, the uh, growth of the cells? And so uh, collaborators of ours in Spain did uh, some cl clonal growth work for us and, and were able to show that in fact, when the enhancer is missing, the cells uh, display a slower clonal growth phenotype if for both MCF7s and for PC9s. We weren't able to do um, the other cell line, the T47D, because in fact we could never really we could never even obtain a homozygous enhancer null, which and we think that the cells just don't survive when they actually acquire that deletion on both alleles in the case of T47Ds. Okay. So now we had uh, some uh, cell lines where we had deleted the enhancer on both alleles, and we decided to look at what effect this has on the transcriptome. So we did RNA-seq, and we saw that SOX2 was the most downregulated gene, but that there was also a broader effect on dysregulating the transcriptome, as you would expect when you downregulate a um, active transcription factor. Um, we also did an attack-seq approach, and we found that 
there were a large number, over two and a half thousand regions that actually lose accessibility when you delete these enhancers. And again, that makes sense with the known role of SOX2 in actually um, causing chromatin opening uh, in the genome. And then to look a little bit more at the mechanisms, we looked at changes um, in the motif representation in open chromatin regions using a footprinting approach, um, using the program uh, Tobias, which was uh, published by uh, Bet Betson et al. And we found that actually largely it's a it's a case of motifs being lost when you uh, remove the enhancers and cause the reduced expression of SOX2, which again tracks with SOX2 mainly causing chromatin opening. And this allowed us to identify some key other transcription factors that the SOX protein is actually probably uh, working with in this context to allow them to bind to previously uh, closed chromatin. Okay. So we had identified this SR124-134 enhancer cluster that was absolutely required for SOX2 expression in breast and lung cancer and looked like it was probably regulating SOX2 overexpression in patient tumors. But we started thinking, well, why would our genome have this region that just causes high expression of an oncogene in cancer? That sounds like a really bad idea. And so we wondered, is this region actually required in another context? And so to try to get a handle on that, we looked at a large collection of uh, DNA's seq data that was compiled across a number of different cell types um, from uh, mostly from human uh, developmental uh, tissues. And what we saw was that these regions are open in cancers, but they're also open in the developing digestive system as well as in the developing uh, pulmonary system. And so we wondered, are they having some kind of role in that context? And to study that, we obviously needed to move to an animal model. And to be able to move to an animal model, we needed to know whether or not these regions were conserved. And so when you look at conservation across mammals, um, and birds and amphibians, you see that each of these regions, that 124 and the 134 region, show um, a conserved right core sequence that is conserved uh, across mammals and even conserved in birds and amphibians. And that then allowed us to use a mouse uh, system to look at what these enhancers might be doing um, outside of a cancer context. And so we created uh, a similar deletion in the mouse genome. The, um, the mouse homologs of those two enhancers, uh, the human enhancers are shown here, and we uh, targeted guides upstream and downstream to remove both regions at the same time. And the first thing that we did was just looked at whether or not we obtained live animals after uh, crossing heterozygous mice. And what we found was that we were, in fact, completely missing the homozygous enhancer null mice um, from a, a heterozygous cross. And that tell, told us that, in fact, the mice need that enhancer for um, normal development. And we then decided to look at just one day uh, before the mice are born. So we looked at E18.5. And we were looking in the pulmonary and digestive system. And what we noticed was this very striking phenotype in that the enhancer deleted mice actually fail to separate their esophagus and trachea. So in wild type mice, um, there is initially just one tube that forms and that tube separates into the trachea and the esophagus. And that separation is actually not happening in the homozygous enhancer null mice. And so when the mice are born, they're not able to uh, breathe properly um, or, or, or feed because they don't have that separation of the trachea and the esophagus. We also looked at SOX2 expression and we saw SOX2 normally expressed in the wild type and in the uh, heterozygous enhancer deleted animals, but in the enhancer null animals, we didn't see any SOX2 expression um, in this uh, tissue. And just so you can have another visualization of what this phenotype looks like, which is called a tracheal esophageal fistula, normally there is um, a trachea uh, that connects to the lungs and the esophagus connects to the stomach. And in this tracheal esophageal fistula, there's just one tube that both connects to the lungs and to the stomach. And that um, the, the mice born with this phenotype uh, will, will die soon after birth. Um, 
And this was actually um, one of the known roles of the SOX2 transcription factor in development is that it had been observed previously to have a role in this tracheal esophageal uh, separation. And now we've been able to identify that this enhancer that gets aberrantly expressed in cancer um, is involved in um, expressing SOX2 in this context to allow for the separation of the trachea and the esophagus. Okay. And so um, now that we sort of knew what this enhancer is, is, is normally, you know, what its normal purpose is in, in the genome and in development, we think this is a highly conserved um, function of this region that's conserved um, in mammals and likely more deeply conserved than that. Um, but we actually wanted to know, well, what are the upstream regulators of this enhancer and what's actually happening in the patient um, tumors to cause this aberrant expression of the enhancer? So again, because there was that large database of open chromatin uh, data available, we could then, and, and paired with RNA-seq data, we could look at the correlation between transcription factor gene expression and open chromatin at these enhancers in a large set of patients. And we found a number of transcription factors that are positively correlated with open chromatin at, at these enhancers and some transcription factors that are negatively correlated with open chromatin. And then we turned to look at chip data that was available for breast cancer. And we identified um, a few key factors that we wanted to study more. So FOXA1, which is more highly expressed in patients that have more open chromatin at these enhancers and also binds to both of the enhancers. And we also were interested to look at this other factor, NFIB, which is more highly expressed in patients that have more closed chromatin at these regions and is also bound to both of these regions. And so one of the first things we did was just reporter assays where we overexpressed either FOXA1 or NFIB. And what we found was that when FOXA1 expression was higher, we could drive enhancer activity that was higher than when FOXA1 was not overexpressed. And then conversely, when we overexpressed NFIB, in most cases, we could drive lower enhancer um, expression, um, reporter expression. And so indicating that FOXA1 is a positive regulator of this enhancer activity and NFIB is a negative uh, regulator of this enhancer activity. Um, we then next wanted to see whether or not these gene, uh, the expression of these transcription factors could actually regulate SOX2 levels. And so we created um, a fusion, a tagged fusion of the endogenous SOX2 gene. And then we used that to look at whether or not expression of FOXA1 or NFIB could change the levels of SOX2 expression. And what we found was that we didn't see much difference when we overexpressed FOXA1. So you can see the green sort of overlays the gray, which is the control. And we think this is because FOXA1 is kind of already expressed at pretty high levels. But when we express NFIB at higher levels, we actually saw this really significant shift to down regulation of SOX2. So indicating that NFIB could indeed repress SOX2 activity, we think through this distal enhancer cluster. And so just in summary, um, the SOX2 airway development enhan enhancers are not accessible in most adult tissues. In breast and lung tumors, we think that increased expression of the pioneer factor FOXA1 causes higher accessibility at this region, recruitment of additional transcription factors and SOX2 expression. And then we identified that NFIB recruitment to the same regions uh, would actually inhibit enhancer activity and SOX2 expression, and that provides a potential way to attenuate the expression of this oncogene, at least possibly in these uh, specific cancer contexts. And I'm just sort of putting this forward as this is sort of a nice, we think, good workflow to be able to start to understand some more of these disease links that are now you know, scattered throughout our genome. So there's more than 6,000 publications with close to 600,000 unique SNP trait linked associations. And 90, more than 90% of these are not in gene coding regions and predicted to affect regulatory elements, but it's very difficult to go from that information to actually understanding more about the mechanism. And so this sort of deletion in cell lines and in animal models can allow us to better understand some of these disease links. 
All right, and uh, thank you everyone for your attention and to everybody who worked on the project, including uh, my collaborators, Michael Hoffman from Princess Margaret in Toronto and uh, Manuel Collado from uh, Santiago de Compostela in Spain. And um, I'm happy to answer questions. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer, for a great talk. Um, I saw there's one question in uh, the Q&A that I will um, summarize for you. If there's any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Uh, I do think for time reasons, we will move on after this one question, but uh, you're welcome to answer any additional questions in the Q&A box. Um, so the question that is there is um, regarding enhanced remarks, specifically K4 mono and K27 acetyl. Um, if um, the chromatin modifiers that deposit these marks, um, if, um, if you know what happens when these modifiers are deleted, um, if that would affect active enhancers. Yeah, so I think it's, it can be difficult to do that because some of them are at least required for cell function, right? So, um, but there, there are some knockdowns. Um, I think the one study that I'm that comes to mind is that in pluripotent cells, they've actually modified the histone um, lysine twenty seven so that it can't be acetylated. I'm forgetting what 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 uh, they changed it to, and they actually found fairly little effect in that case on the cellular phenotype. And so, yeah, I think we don't always know to what extent these modifications are. Um, actually causing a functional difference in the histone association with DNA. And in some cases, it's probably more um, of a marking feature, or maybe it's just something that's associated with activity, but maybe is not an absolute requirement in some cases. So yeah, I think there's still a little bit of lack of clarity on some of those points. Um, but there is correlation with targeting some of these modifying activities to regions and being able to cause enhancer activity after targeting. So, you know, I think it, it's it's not a simple answer, but but yeah, that's where I'm going to stop. Great, thank you. Uh, I think there might be some more questions coming into the Q and A. If you want to take the time to answer them there, that would be really great. Um, okay, then uh, we will move on now um, to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ian Tobias. Um, so uh, Ian did his PhD at Western University, uh, after which he joined the Mitchell Lab uh, at the University of Toronto for his postdoc. And recently, and I've heard very, very recently, <laughs> Ian became an alumni of the Mitchell Lab. And as of the start of this month, has started his own lab uh, as an assistant professor at the University of Guelph. Um, today, uh, Ian will be talking uh, about SOX2 cis regulatory elements in neuronal commitment. Uh, so whenever you are ready, Ian, um, please take it away. Thank you, Sana. I think everyone should be able to see my cursor. Uh, you can bump me if that's not going through. Um, and Okay, great. And thank you for everyone for, for sticking with us here on a, on a Friday before a long weekend. So Dr. Mitchell just gave a, a really fantastic overview um, and gave us some specific examples of enhancer-mediated gene regulation in that previous talk. And I think it's just really worth repeating that for many developmental genes to achieve the temporal and spatial transcriptional specificity, transcription factors must bind uh, and assemble with coactivators at these regulatory elements. We also know that this usually occurs at potentially multiple different regulatory elements or enhancers, and that these may be located at various distances away from the gene itself. And we use this evidence of transcription factor binding, particularly uh, lineage specific or lineage appropriate factors, along with coactivator recruitment, uh, to infer regulatory activity at both gene promoters and enhancers. Um, and so, as we just heard, we, we, uh, this transcription factor SRY homeobox uh, 2 guides cell differentiation and can uh, maintain the identity of a variety of stem and progenitor cell types. Um, and so, just by way of reminder, specific expression of SOX2 is involved actually in this uh, first classical lineage segregation event occurring uh, very on in early embryos. Um, and so specific expression actually uh, in the epiblast marked by these blue cells 
um, is involved in the segregation of the epiblast from the outer epithelial lining known as the trophectoderm. And SOX2 expression is initially limited to these inner pluripotent cells, uh, where it is actually required for epiblast development. And this epiblast is important because it is the precursor to all embryonic cell types and, of course, a source of embryonic stem cell lines. Uh, after gastrulation, SOX2 expression in the neural ectoderm marks a population or multiple populations of multipotent cells that give rise to the brain and optic system rostrally or towards the head and the spinal cord towards the caudal end of the embryo. And we know from genetically engineered mice that neural stem and progenitor cells or NSPCs require SOX2 for the maintenance of their proliferative state. And that tissue specific deletion of SOX2 um, depending on the time of the deletion, can cause brain malformations in these mouse models. And so, um, as Dr. Mitchell described, we used a um, mouse embryonic stem cells as an in vitro model. And for this study, we used a directed differentiation approach, starting with mouse embryonic stem cells. And in this protocol, we enrich for essentially a mixture of SOX2 expressing neural stem and progenitor cells, or NSPCs. And these time points and differentiation states align with uh, published and consortium data, which give us a really rich foundation of protein occupancy and epigenetic information that we can use to guide enhancer prediction. And so what I'm showing you here might look a little bit more familiar now to you uh, is just a snapshot of the SOX2 locus in the mouse. And you can see in these uh, orange colored tracks on the top, these are data from embryonic stem cells SOX2 is on the left-hand side here. And downstream of SOX2, we have this high signal domain, which represents that model pluripotency-associated enhancer cluster, the SOX2 control region. Um, as Dr. Mitchell showed you, it is actually a cluster of multiple different SOX2 regulatory regions, or SRRs. And one thing that's really fascinating is that these distal SOX2 regulatory regions actually lose their histone H3 lysine 27 acetylation and mediator uh, subunit recruitment, as shown by MED1, in these neural progenitor cells, which are represented by the blue tracks here. And so this really highlights that the SCR becomes uh, decommissioned or shut down during neural commitment. And so we've asked the question, what's contributing to the transcriptional specificity of SOX2 in neural development? And just for the rest of the seminar today, I'm gonna be focusing on this downstream SOX2 flanking region which actually retains a good amount of histone acetylation in the neural stem and progenitor population. And so we use uh, a hybrid mouse embryonic stem cell line uh, to create our deletions in, in a mouse pluripotent stem cell model. It consists of a cross between a lab-derived 129 strain and a wild-derived Castaneous strain. And we use this high density of genetic variation to separate um, the maternal and paternal copies of each chromosome, allowing us to detect transcripts derived from each respective haplotype to infer um, cis mechanisms affecting transcription. And to create our regulatory mutants, we're simply transfecting your classical SPCAS9, CRISPR endonuclease, as well as guide RNA plasmids to target the margins of any elements of interest. And again, we can leverage these high SNP densities to resolve the maternal or paternal chromosome harboring the targeted deletion. And so the first question we asked is, if this uh, acetylated SOX2 flanking domain contains cis activators of SOX2, we should be able to interfere with the transcriptional dynamics of in neural lineage commitment by only deleting these proximal regions. And so I'm showing you um, allele-specific quantitative PCR targeting SOX2 transcripts only derived from the Castaneous allele for clarity. And this uh, allele is targeted by two different deletions in this experiment, one of the pluripotency-associated SOX2 control region, and the other of these uh, predicted enhancers that flank the SOX2 region in the neural lineage. And so this unmodified parent cell line is shown in a blue tracing. It follows the expected dynamics of SOX2 expression in this differentiation model. And SOX2 initially decreases during the undirected stages of this protocol and then uh, once uh, cells have committed to the neural ectoderm lineage, we get high levels of SOX2 transcription being reestablished. And so this orange tracing is in SCR null cells, 
And so this is a very consistent result with the SCR being dispensable for neural differentiation. These cells are initially deficient in their SOX2 expression, but really have no issues uh, upregulating or inducing SOX2 transcription during neural stem and progenitor cell differentiation. However, um, in this expression time course we're plotting in gray, uh, we have genetically modified lines that carry deletion of the proximal neural enhancer regions. And we see here that SOX2 reactivation in the neural lineage is blunted. And so just zooming in on this uh, 18 kilobase uh, downstream region of SOX2, we actually see a high degree of overlap in the binding of transcription factors that are normally expressed either in neural stem cells or in bulk neocortical tissue. And this local density of transcription factor bound regions uh, really points to these discrete core enhancer regions, several of them residing within this broader SR2 to 18 enhancer cluster region. So uh, after genotyping many clones, we checked the SOX2 expression of these different genotypes with uh, allele-specific uh, SOX2 quantitative PCR. And I'm showing you the expression from uh, both alleles, the 129 and the Castaneous here. Um, and regardless of which allele we targeted for deletion, um, we found that the uh, uh, SR2 to 18 region is responsible for between a third and half of cis-linked SOX2 expression in the cell population. So I'm showing you an example here where the deletion is on the 129 allele and we see a significant uh, uh, difference compared to the parent control. We are also able to derive homozygous null lines, uh, which reproducibly show these biallelic SOX2 expression deficits. And we've since been able to confirm this with uh, RNA sequencing by sorting the reads based on uh, overlapping with these many uh, SNPs in our hybrid system. Um, but today I'm actually gonna be focusing on one of the interesting phenotypes that we described for these neural SOX2 regulatory mutants. And we characterize them with uh, uh, attack sequencing as well as bulk RNA sequencing. So although we can detect subtle transcriptomic differences between um, SR2 to 18 deletions on the maternally inherited versus the paternally inherited chromosomes, the analysis I'm showing you here is focusing on the common differential gene expression phenotype that we see in both heterozygous deletions. And we see a strong induction of Hox-B factors, as well as components of the sonic hedgehog signaling pathway. And I'm highlighting this to you because in the developing neural tube, sonic hedgehog and other morphogens are important for establishing dorsal ventral and rostral caudal gradients that are essential to pattern formation. And this essentially segments the developing central nervous system into several broad zones, namely the forebrain, the midbrain, the hindbrain, and the spinal cord, by restricting the regional identity and potency of neural progenitors within this tissue. And the specific Hox factors that we see becoming activated in these regulatory mutants represent the progenitor zones of the CNS that are fated to become the spinal cord. And so our interpretation of this phenotype is that one potential uh, role of this SR2 to 18 enhancer cluster could be to maintain SOX2 expression and support rostral neural progenitor identities while its ablation or deletion sensitizes neural progenitors to caudal regionalization towards the spinal cord tissues. And so we've looked at the level and function of the SOX2 protein in this deletion series. And in the upper panel, I'm showing you a proximity ligation amplification assay where uh, each focus or dot represents a, uh, a snapshot of SOX2 and RNA polymerase in, in close uh, spatial proximity. And when we go to quantitate this, we see a decrease in the median frequency of these PLA foci in NSPCs derived from either heterozygous or homozygous clones. And so this suggests that a reduction in SOX2 dosage, even from a monoallelic deletion of this enhancer cluster, is sufficient to impact the contribution of SOX2 to uh, what, we're, what we're predicting are transcriptionally active, uh, transcriptional complexes rather. It's worth reminding that, um, as, as Dr. Mitchell said, the uh, SOX family of transcription factors are recognized to maintain the accessibility of binding sites across the genome through their interactions with chromatin and even initiating remodeling at inaccessible chromatin to facilitate the bindings of other 
more collaborative uh, transcription factors. So we next asked, uh, to what degree is genome-wide chromatin accessibility affected in these regulatory mutants? And so we did this using ATAC-seq in bulk neural stomach progenitor cells, uh, comparing the, the parent line control to those with a biallelic SR2 to 18 deletion. And I'll first draw your attention to the pattern of chromatin accessibility at the SOX2 locus and control cells. We see that at least three uh, the neural SOX2 enhancers show evidence of nucleosome depletion in the control. And secondly, that there is a marked decrease in chromatin accessibility at the SOX2 promoter in the uh, homozygous SR2 to 18 deletion clones. What we were a little surprised by was that this regulatory mutant would show uh, tens of thousands of differentially accessible regions genome-wide. And this is really a profound change in the, in the chromatin landscape, we thought, that was uh, more consistent with a shift in transcriptional regulatory networks that define cell identity. And we initially suspected that um, altered SOX2 protein function in these regulatory mutants could explain some of the losses of chromatin accessibility in these uh, regulatory mutants. And when I looked at the subset of regions that are typically bound by SOX2 in NSPCs, we see that there's a decrease in the average attack seek signal in these mutant lines. Additionally, when we look genome-wide, we can find uh, examples of decreased chromatin accessibility uh, that are correlated with reduced expression of very canonical and classical markers of neurogenesis, such as ASCL1, which is a, a shoot-related proneural gene. Finally, we asked what in addition to SOX2 could be contributing to these changes in chromatin accessibility and gene expression. And so we did digital footprinting in our attack seq data, which revealed uh, differential abundances of several sequence motifs. Um, in the, the parent cell line uh, attack peaks, we see overrepresented motifs corresponding to transcriptional regulators that are present in forebrain progenitors, whereas uh, motifs enriched in our SR2 to 18 homozygous null NSPCs align with major posteriorizing uh, transcription factor families, as well as uh, the AP1 family of transcription factors. When we compared our peak sets of our NSPCs to ENCODE embryonic tissue attack seek data as a benchmark, we see pretty clearly that our biallelic deletion clones have fewer accessible regions overlapping with forebrain attack seek peaks and a higher percentage of peaks. Uh, uh, attack peaks that overlap with the neural tube, which is the precursor tissue to the spinal cord. We also used a non-selective differentiation medium to induce neuronal and glial lineage commitment in these lines, and we analyzed the functional profile of genes showing reduced expression in the progeny of these mutant neural progenitors. And this gene set enrichment analysis highlighted that there are really uh, multiple processes associated with uh, lineage development and cell differentiation, specifically in the anterior neural tissues in the forebrain, um, including differentiation of neuronal and various glial cell types. So just to briefly recap some of the core biology I shared, um, uh, SOX2 is regulated by different cis-regulatory regions in embryonic stem cells versus in vitro-derived neural stem and progenitor cells. We validated this downstream proximal enhancer cluster, SR2-18, to as a uh, cis-regulatory enhancer of SOX2 expression in mouse neural stem and progenitor cells. We found that uh, two intact copies of SR2-18 to is essential for SOX2 protein function in NSBCs that we derive from these embryonic stem cells. And uh, lastly, uh, loss of this SR2-18 to mediated SOX2 regulation induced the expression of genes involved in caudal regionalization of embryos and impaired uh, the activation of forebrain-associated um, cell types. And so if you'd like to learn more about our approaches or the broader significance of our study to the mechanisms of SOX2 transcription specificity and neural development, you can check out our, our preprint on BioArchive right now. And uh, so I'd like to... Uh, mention and acknowledge all of the different Mitchell Lab members that contributed to this, including many alumni that uh, graduated or moved on uh, while I was a postdoc there. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Ian, for a great talk.
Uh, if people have any questions, feel free to put them in a Q&A box, or you can also raise your hand if you want to ask it in person. Um, if while people are potentially working on questions, I, I do have one, well, actually multiple, but I'll ask one. <laughs> um, when seeing these large scale differences in accessibility, um, did you look at or do you expect to also see changes in um, you know, marks uh, of, say, heterochromatin like H3K9 trimethylation? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm curious about what um, the state of the the silencing would be of those, specifically the regionalization genes. Whether these are ones that are uh, uh, more facultative heterochromatin versus, you know, really much more compacted and silenced K9 trimethylation domains. Um, we see uh, many different transcription factor families uh, change within. The, the motifs overrepresented in these attack footprints. And of course, we're not really sure the nature of uh, what these could be recruiting to different uh, uh, regulatory regions and, and transcriptional start sites across the genome. But it would be, again, yeah, something really fascinating to look into as, as this project moves forward. Great, thank you. Um, and maybe one last question, um, which kind of um, relates to both of the talks of today. Um, I was wondering if um, these large enhancer clusters that are that you're um, working on regarding SOX2, if any of those also exist um, for any of the other Yamanaka factors, and if either one of you is going to be looking at those. <laughs> so as far as the Yamanaka clusters um, factors go, I mean, KLF4 is one that has um, a really well-characterized enhancer cluster. Um, of, of three different enhancers um, that, that some groups have looked at. And it's been a model locus for um, uh, transcription factor recruitment and residence time at enhancers. So more of the biophysical aspects of it. That's a really interesting locus where it seems there's really one core enhancer unit that supports the entire cluster. Um, whereas the uh, SCR is, is kind of relying on two classical enhancers there. Um, I can't recall if there's a more distal enhancer of OCT4. I know that there's two more promoter proximal ones. Um, maybe Jennifer has some other targets in mind that I'm not aware of. Great. OCT4 and NANOG, there have been some studies of distal regulatory regions as well. I think OCT4, the closer ones are more dominant, but there are some other more further out elements that seem to have some role. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's actually one question in the Q&A um, that we will take. Oh, where did I move it? Oh, here. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up. So the question is, uh, Hox upregulation suggests to me a dampening in polycom heterochromatin function. Did you look at this? So we haven't looked at it, but I, I have seen... Uh... I have seen the study where um, that Hox locus, the Hox group six through nine, do seem to be regulated by um, H3, K K27 trimethylation by the polycomb complex. Um, and that is um, uh, linked to CDX2 and four um, expression as well. So what we see is uh, kind of correlating with those results, but it's not something that we've looked into mechanistically whether and, and what time point that epigenetic remodeling might be happening. Um, there's some more questions popping up if you if you want to take them. In the sure, yeah. Uh, the next uh, question, yeah. Or you can, I, I'll, I'll just read it out. <laughs> um, Dr. Lorenz is asking, uh, do you imagine that the complexity of the SOX2 enhancer landscape is driven by and its important role across many cell types? I, I do think that that is, um, you know, a, a hypothesis in the field that um, because there is such a need from an evolutionary standpoint for careful control of SOX2 expression across multiple tissues, multiple cell types within those tissues, not only the stem cell populations, but also, for instance, in the brain, SOX2 expression is maintained in some neuron subpopulations and also um, in many different types of astrocytes. And um, uh, reporter studies that have looked at activity in vivo do see a lot of uh, 
um, very tight specificity being driven by different individual enhancers, uh, predicting enhancers, or even ultra-conserved sequences uh, around the SOX2 locus. So that would be consistent with that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, both Dr. Ian Tobias and Dr. Jennifer Mitchell for his great talks. Um, also, thank you to everybody who attended today, uh, as well as to uh, Mason from Active Motif for helping us run this seminar series. Uh, our next seminar will be in April, uh, I believe, and information will be coming up on the This is Epigenetics website, so keep an eye out. Um, you can also watch back uh, most of our seminars there, too. Uh, so with that, thank you, everyone, and see you next time.